If you could, please bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, as we gather today, this, this Pentecost Sunday, we're reminded of the transformative power of your Spirit, breathing life into dry bones and igniting the hearts of your people. Just as you enlivened the early church with the wind and fire of your presence, empower us to prophesy life into the, into the brokenness of our world and help us to open our hearts and open our lives to receive the Holy Spirit and to rebirth the church here on earth. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, so I need some help today. Is that mine? Is that the cell phone in the back? We're going to pretend it's not. But I need some help today. So who does not like, show of hands, who does not like a good love story? So who likes a good love story? Put your hand down, John. <laughs> There's some great love stories in film. We have some greats out there. What is a really great love story romantic movie that you all like to watch? I need to hear some answers. I need some help today. Titanic, Notebook, there's The Lake House, there's Meet Joe Black, there's Breakfast at Tiffany's, one of my favorites. But you know what my, and I just recently, this is what came to mind, I just recently re-watched one of my favorite, favorite romance movies of all time. Love story, the greatest, greatest love story, Rocky. <laughs> because at the end of the day, Rocky is a great love story. It reads like, like, like four like, like, like acts of, of some marvelous play, just like the Book of Ruth, which we're going to talk about today. The Book of Ruth is this great love story. It reads like, like a Shakespearean play. So many times it looks like things are going to work out and then something happens to, to threaten it. Even if it did not have anything to do with the genealogy of Jesus, the themes of, of redemption, and a prototype of the Messiah, the Book of Ruth would be a great piece of ancient literature. And it does have all that. Woven in and out of the pages is the story of love and redemption. God's unseen hand is behind the scenes, taking care of Ruth and Boaz. Okay, I gotta do it. Forgive me for this one. Did you know that before, he, before they got married, Boaz was ruthless? That was bad. That was bad. Other times we find ourselves, in, and, and as we can see in, in ourselves in that story, we can see tough situations, we can see ourselves in tough situations filled with disappointment. And we wonder, in all this disappointment and, and angst, we wonder, does God even care? Does anybody even care? Well, Ruth is a book that, that cries out, that God cares. So if you can, please join me. Turn to Ruth 2. Ruth 2. Break out those cell phone apps. I really got to start bringing the large print. Ruth 2, 2 through 7. Ruth 2, 1, 2 through 7. One day, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. And Naomi replied, All right, all right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to, to gather grain, gather grain behind the harvesters. And as it happened, she found herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that one. Let's go with it. Let's go with Elam. Elam. Help me out here, sir. Can you pronounce the name? Bubba. <laughs> of her father-in-law, Bubba. While she was there, Boaz 
arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. Then Boaz asked his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? And the foreman replied, she is the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could, if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She's been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. And so is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I love a good love story. I love a good romance story. And there's a story that a boy fell in love with a girl he met in another town. He would write her letters to express his love and devotion to her. His love was so great that it was not uncommon for him to write seven or eight love letters a week. This went on for months. At first, she would reply with letters of her own just, just as often as the boy did. But after several weeks, they began, to, they began to taper off. And at the end of three months, the boy was no longer receiving any letters whatsoever. In desperation. So, so we all know those people, you know, maybe it, it's, it's a co-worker and they, they seem all professional and maybe it's a neighbor and they seem all professional, they seem all put together, but then you hear about their lifestyle after work and, and the things that they get into in their lives and maybe it's about somebody, maybe it's, it's the other nice person, but they just, they're just so hypercritical, hypercritical and super negative. Or maybe it's somebody who you know and let's think. And if I were to say, hey, that person was a hot mess in a dumpster fire, you all would know who I'm talking about because you just immediately would have somebody pop into your head. There would be somebody pop in our minds because we're all sinners. We go through every single day with a goal in mind and something we want, something we desperately want. We have an end goal. We go through every single day changing our minds based on our circumstances, our disappointments. And this boy, this boy was disappointed he was a hot mess of a dumpster fire. And how many of you have had problems or, or tragedy or disappointment in your life? Everybody would raise their hands on that one. Maybe God sent, sent them to wake you up and cause you to repent of your sins and turn to God while there's time. Maybe the disappointments. It's a good excuse. It's a good time to turn to God. Wow, there's still time. You see, sin is nothing more than a state of, of brokenness. It's a condition that, that leads us to prioritize our own desires, our own self-interest over God's will. Did you know, and this came up recently in the conversation, did you know there is one unforgivable sin, one abomination, hence the character on the front of the bulletin, and that sin would be the one sin that God cannot forgive. And that would be intentionally walking away from the Spirit and God's truth. It's unforgivable because forgiveness is not sought. Think about it. Think about how, how Jonah, and so many times we're like Jonah. Jonah said, I'll go where I want to go. I'll live how the way I want to live. And that's right, Jonah. You've got that option. You all have that option. Living how you want to live. Going where you want to go. But I want to tell you that the price is tremendous if you follow your will over God's. The Bible says that Jonah went to sleep in, in the boat. And sin, sin can be like that. Sin can be like a sedative. It just calms you sometimes. Sin is, that, sin is so exciting at first. And then after a bit, it's boring. And after a while, you lose your conscience and sensitivity to sin. And the sins get greater and, and your conscience becomes dead. And, and what a terrible thing it is when your conscience is dead. Sin leaves towers, towers of disappointment in your life. It's all about choices. Choices when we have disappointments. Choices when we have what looks like setbacks. The, and this, this boy in the story, he had choices. The boy was disappointed, and in desperation, he wrote one last letter. And he was demanding to know if she still had feelings for him, or if this short relationship was over. And the girl wrote back to the disheartened little boy, 
and informed him how she would, she would wait on the porch and, and look for the postman to bring the mail. She confessed that, that her feelings toward the boy had diminished until they were practically gone. Then she explained why. Every single day, she was waiting on the porch for the mailman to bring the letters. And now she was marrying the mailman. Love is strange, isn't it? It's strange how and, and where it shows up. And that same thing is true for Ruth. After all, who would ever expect to find love in a field? Look at what happened to Ruth prior to gleaning from another's field. She's a widow. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, is, is Jewish and decides, decides to go back to Jerusalem, goes back to excuse me, Bethlehem. Ruth makes a decision to go with Naomi and leave all that she knows. And part of that decision is accepting that she may never marry again. She becomes a foreigner in a, in a strange land. She has no job or means of getting food, so she's left to gleaning. This is the Jewish equivalent of welfare. And this is not a Hollywood movie, and, and we should not romanticize her situation. Ruth has only one companion. She is completely out of her element. She is completely out of her comfort zone. And she's living off the generosity of strangers and others. And there's no pretty way to paint this picture. She is down to her last nickel and at the end of her rope. One more bad break and it may spell the end for Ruth. However, just like every good romance movie, like every love story, just when we think all is lost, hope. Hope shows up. Ruth isn't the only one to experience that. When Jesus walks on the water in chapter 14 of Matthew, he shows up in the fourth watch of the night. That is between 3 and 6 in the morning. The disciples were in that boat all night long, certain that they were going to die. And Jesus shows up right before dawn. Now, I don't know why God operates like that, but I do know this. If I expect Jesus to do what I tell him to do when I tell him to do it, the roles of servant and master have been reversed. See, we're not so different from Ruth. We're in an awful situation as well. We just might not be aware of it. And you got there, there's one visionary who told the story, who told his experience traveling in a ship across the Caspian Sea. He states that there were more passengers than there were rooms for them. And when he spotted a man in the cabin by himself, this, this missionary inquired about being seated there. The porter returns to say, I am sorry, but the man says that he cannot ride with you. He's a French diplomat, and you're just a missionary. The gentleman says he's a French diplomat that represents a shaky kingdom with numerous governments. And I'm an ambassador to an unshakable kingdom that has only one ruler. And later in that trip, the diplomat managed to get himself locked in a bathroom. And in desperation, he was calling out for help. And it was the missionary who arrived to extricate him. And he reflected on how amusing it was for the ambassador of the kingdom of God to extricate the diplomat from the kingdom of France. But then isn't that what the ambassadors of the kingdom must do? Extricate the diplomats of this world who have boxed themselves up into bathrooms of impossible ways of life and are saying, if they only knew it, please, sirs, free me. See, sin, sin has alienated us from God. If something is not done to extricate us, to free us from the situation, we'll not only live separated from God, we will die eternally separated from God. And this is the, this is the awful reality of our spiritual situation. Ruth did not hide from the desperate nature of her situation. And we can't either. We may fill our lives with things that distract us from this reality, but none of them can alter it. 
I was asked recently what I thought faith was. Faith and trust. Ruth never complains. She keeps trying to make the best of her situation. What she finds is not only a field to, to glean in, but an owner who shows her favor. When Boaz shows, us, shows up to, to inspect the work going on in his field, he inquires about this, about this new woman. And notice what the men tell him. First, they know all about her terrible situation. It might be gossip. It may be pity. Or it may be matter of fact. But they know about Ruth. Secondly, she's polite. She observes the customs of the land. She knows that she's a foreigner and might not be welcomed. So she asks permission to participate in the Jewish custom of gleaning. And finally, number three... They tell Boaz that she's a hard worker. She's worked all morning only to take a short break. What he sees and, and what he hears stirs the, the heart of Boaz. For he will ask Ruth not to, you know, to, to not visit any field but his. Invites her to have lunch with him. Instructs the workers to make sure that they, they, leave, that they intentionally leave grain behind for her. Boaz showers abundant love upon Ruth. Just like we're treated to abundant love. And later when Naomi hears of how Boaz has treated Ruth, she asks, who showed you such favor? The word here for favor is, is chest. And the, the best translation we have for it is, is, is loving grace. It's a combination of the expression of love and unmerited or undeserved grace. Is this sounding familiar to anybody? Nothing Ruth did obligated Boaz to shower his love upon her. Boaz more than fulfilled Jewish law by allowing a foreigner to glean in his field. But Boaz went a step further. He went beyond the bounds of the, of the law. He demonstrated an, an undeserved and unearned love for Ruth. There's a husband, story time, there's a husband who had battled a mysterious illness for some months and found himself at the hospital with his wife. He was undergoing a series of tests. And after the last test, the doctor told the man he could get dressed and he motions for the wife to follow him out into the hallway. And he explained to the wife that her husband had this rare blood disease and immediate treatment was necessary. She responded, certainly, doctor, you bet. What do I need to do? The doctor explained how the man needed rest, should not work anymore. He needs a two- to three-hour nap in the middle of every day. That was essential. On top of that, that diet needed to be considered. The husband needed three well-balanced, home-cooked meals every day without exception. The cleanliness of the house was another issue the doctor raised. Any bit of dust could be taken into the lungs and alter the husband's health adversely. Finally, the husband required three massages a day to increase the blood flow to the limbs and, and throughout the body. Before they went back to the room, the doctor asked if the wife understood all of this, and that without such an approach, the disease would claim, not could, would claim her husband's life. And wiping the tears from her eyes, she nodded that she did understand and thanked the doctor for his time and his attention. She collected herself and walked back into the examination room where her husband was putting on his shoes. He looks at her and asks, what did the doctor say? To which the wife replied, the doctor says you're going to die. <laughs> it's one thing to love people when we see how we can receive love in return. But it's something else to love with no promise of love returned. Boaz had no guarantee of Ruth returning his affection. But this, this is the nature of abundant, grace-filled love. See, God demonstrates his unearned and undeserved love to us and for us in so many ways. 
The ultimate example, though, was, was while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. The Bible tells us no greater love has a man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. In the midst of our, of our awful situation, God has shown up and showered his love and his favor upon each one of us. And Ruth, catch out what Ruth happens next. Ruth is overwhelmed by the mercy and the kindness of Boaz. His generosity of love is more than, than she could have ever hoped for. She went, she went and she had hoped to, to gather enough food for her and Naomi to have a meal that night. But because of, of Boaz, she had enough food for a month. Her best hope that morning was for a place to glean. But because of Boaz, that afternoon she found exceeding kindness. She would have been satisfied with fair treatment. Because of Boaz, Ruth returned home with the hope of a kinsman redeemer. And in Jewish law, a widow would often become the wife of a close relative who would provide for her. Boaz was that kinsman redeemer. He could marry Ruth and rescue her from her desperate situation. And according to Jewish law, there were, there were three requirements a kinsman redeemer had to fulfill. He must be a kinsman, someone of close relationship to the deceased. He must be able to financially support his new wife. And he had to have the desire to fulfill that position. What we need, what we need, what you need, what each of us needs is someone who can rescue us from our desperate situation. And notice how Jesus fulfills the requirements of the kinsman redeemer. He's a close relative. For the scriptures refer to him as, as the second Adam. He's able to care for us because he's the all-powerful creator and sustainer of the universe. And finally, Jesus has, has a great desire to be our redeemer the creator of the universe, the one who became a man so that he could die for us once to redeem you. And maybe you came here this morning with a lot on your mind, a lot on your heart, disappointments, stress, anxieties, troubles. Maybe you came here this morning needing a spiritual pick-me-up just to get through the work, just, just to get through the week, just a little bit of something. Maybe you're just looking for a place where you, could, where you could be around some people and find companionship. It could be that you, were, you would be pleased with some great music, a few interesting thoughts, a nice handshake, a hug, a bad joke, warm coffee. However, this morning, the owner of the vineyard has shown up and he wants a relationship with you. You've caught his eye. He knows your past. He knows your shame. He knows the choices you've made, your guilt, and your situation. And he's showing you with his unearned, undeserved love. This morning, you may be just, just trying to survive. But hope has shown up. I found out, I was reading, doing my research, and I came across this story. And we're going to be ending pretty soon. I only got another hour to go. But somewhere around the 1920s, I'm not going to make a mom joke. Somewhere around the 1920s, there was a ship that rammed an S-4 submarine off the coast of Massachusetts. This sub sank immediately. And while the rescuers were attempting to save the seamen, a diver heard a sound coming from the sub. He put his helmet next to the hull and, and heard someone tapping out Morse code. Is there any hope, it said. Well, you may think that you are trapped in your desperate situation with no way out. You're pounding out a message on the hull of your life. Is there any hope? 
And Jesus answers that there is hope, that he is the hope. So this morning, would you exchange your awful situation for an amazing hope and discover his amazing love? Let's bow our heads. Let's keep in mind, we don't need to be afraid that God's Holy Spirit brings us healing, comfort, and hope. And that we are being prepared to serve God in, in some mighty ways. So let us rejoice, for God's Holy Spirit is with us always. Amen.